Welcome to Loyola Marymount University's Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles' 2008 Urban Lecture Series. Today's panel, Scholars of Los Angeles, features authors from the newly released two-volume book, The Development of Los Angeles City Government, A History, 1850-2000, to published by the Los Angeles City Historical Society and solely distributed by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. For more information about this book and today's panel, please visit www.lmu.edu slash CSLA. This is a great collaborative effort by the, I would say, the collective of LA scholars that put this book together. And I'm going to have my colleague and good friend Steve Erie. Many of you know by reputation because you are reading some of his books, uh, who's going to make a couple of comments uh, about mm -hmm. this. Again, welcome to the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles Urban Lecture Series here at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, Steve. Fernando, thanks. This, uh, like the city of Los Angeles, this is an improbable project. If you think about LA 100 years ago, no water, no harbor, thousands of miles, no hinterland, thousands of miles from major centers like Chicago in the east. And how did this city magically grow? Well, Hinda Rudd, who is retired, the city uh, archivist, was the driving force behind basically looking at the history of L.A. city government going all the way back to, what, 1850, when <clears throat> after, I don't know, how, how it's taught in your classes, is it the Yankee conquest or uh, uh, the California, right, becoming, uh, becoming an American territory? But the city of Los Angeles goes back to 18... Just, just, just to tell my students, this is the first stage that's going to be on your midterm that he's talking about oh, right now. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, but now we're into the Reconquista, so <laughs> turn around is fair play. Uh, but Hinda had a dream, and Hinda's dream as the archivist in the city clerk's office, and by the way, her office was in the Irwin Piper Technical Center. That's where the LAPD helicopters land, over on the other side of the freeway by the Piper way, Center. Who, who was Piper? Erwin Piper was the first CAO, City Administrative Officer, for Los Angeles in the early 50s. He came from the FBI, which tells you something about the politics of Los Angeles back in the 1950s. Well, Hinda had this dream that here is this great improbable city, and why don't we write a history of its charter, its government, its agencies, its relationship to society, to the economy. This was an incredibly ambitious project. And she got a little money from the John Randolph and Dora Haynes Foundation. Many of us... Can I stop you? For, that is the same foundation that helped fund the um, exit poll that we all just did. So all the money that we had to buy you lunch and do all that kind of stuff and pay for your gas came from the same foundation that funded this book as well. And this guy, so, so who, who were John, who John, John, and John Dora Haynes? Well, Dora Haynes was a, uh, was a great suffragette. They were progressives of the liberal persuasion a hundred years ago. John Randolph Haynes wrote the previous city charter. He was really the godfather of the 1925 charter of Los Angeles. He was a big proponent of public water, public power. Uh, he was on the Civil Service Commission, but he was a major player. I frequently call him the, the not-so-secret reform boss of Los Angeles. How did he make his money? He made his money the old-fashioned way. He was first a physician, and then he speculated in real estate. Now, his politics, understand that, that he dealt with the city's elite. Otis and Chandler of the Times they castigated Haynes, who they saw as this left-wing municipal ownership kind of guy in the paper. But at night, they'd have drinks together, right? And, uh, and as I said, he was the attending uh, position. But anyway, so we got... That sounds like the Jesuits here. At, at the rate that I'm going, we're going to be here for about 45 minutes. So let's cut, cut to the chase. We got Haynes money. Uh, and we put together a board of uh, editors, and I think, Larry, you were on the editorial board, so, so was I. Tom Sitton, uh, who wrote the biography of John Randolph Haynes, Joyce Nunes, uh, Mr. L.A. History out of USC, 
but a, a great group of people, and one of the first things we did is we picked authors to do the, at one point we had like 40 or 50. Uh, it's cut down a bit, and this was all in the late 1990s. Well, this is now 2008. The book was just published very recently, I think in late 2007. This was an impossible dream of Hinda Rudd's, and uh, it was like the perils of Pauline, trying to get the funding to continue it, to get publication, and now it's out. And it's an extraordinary two volumes. Uh, it's $108, a little stiff, talk to your folks, but it's a book, any of you who have the kind of love affair that we have with the city of Los Angeles, it is a required book, and it's required reading. So that's just a little history on the project. And we have some copies right here, so if anybody wants to buy it, we could actually add it to your student account and just pass it on to your parents for some of you. So we, we can hand, handle it that way. Um, also on the editorial board was uh, Father Mike Gang, who's the dean of the College of uh, Liberal Arts, the Bellarmine College of, of Liberal Arts. Um, Steve, we've heard from Steve Airy. He's a professor at UC uh, San Diego in the political science department. He is also a um, director of the Urban Studies and Planning Program at UC San Diego. He's the author of one of the books that you are currently reading, The uh, Globalizing LA, Politics of Trade, Infrastructure, and Regional Development, which was published in 2004. And just recently, and I just got it, is a, a new book also about water. It's called Beyond Chinatown. And I'm going to want you to talk about why Beyond Chinatown in the title. The Metropolitan Water District, Growth and the Environment of Southern California, 2006. So Steve, you've heard a little bit about him. I'm going to pass and, and go over to our own uh, Dr. Mara Marks to start this off, just asking her how she uh, got involved and what is her article about and uh, how did the, uh, that whole process go. But just to give us a brief uh, interview, in or excuse me, a brief summary of her article, and then I'll also ask uh, Dr. DeGraff to do the same thing. Uh, Dr. Marks, as many of you know, is Assistant Professor of Sociology and Urban Studies here at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, she is the author of Shifting... Assistant. I'm uh, not assistant. associate yet. Okay. <laughs> in, in my book, you're an associate professor already. It's a foregone I conclusion. Um, she is the author of Shifting Ground, the Rise and Fall of Los Angeles Community Redevelopment Agency, uh, also co-author of Harmony and Bliss in Los Angeles, Public Opinion, a Decade After the 1992 Riot, and a variety of different other manuscripts that uh, are soon to be published. Um, Dr. Marsh, why don't you start us off and talk a little bit about uh, the process of being involved in this project and then also what your article was about. Uh, the process of being involved in this was basically, I was at um, UCLA looking for a dissertation topic and um, ha was handed that topic by Professor Erie and um, he suggested that I look at urban redevelopment and the community redevelopment agency. And mm -hmm. I dutifully trekked it down to the Piper Center where the archi historical archives for the redevelopment agency were, um, were held. And um, I got to know Hinda Rudd who toiled away there in the, 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 the bowels of the Piper Center um, underneath the landing helicopters and behind the Denny's and just up the road from a bunch of strip clubs and uh, Toy Town, and it's just very colorful location. No, I did not. I don't want to make. I don't want to make any comments about the strip club. I don't <laughs> just I know what's around there because I, I got lost a lot. Um, okay, well that's an excuse a lot of students use also when they end up over there. <laughs> now, as, as Professor Gary already um, explained, this um, this two-volume set was a very long uh, birthing process, so frankly, I don't think I remember what my article even was about anymore. <laughs> but um, it is about urban redevelopment, and um, there are a few um, issues and themes that, um, that urban redevelopment just um, illustrate about city politics in general and Los Angeles in general, and we can kind of maybe talk about some of those common themes later. Um, some of the things that, that in reflecting about urban redevelopment and what I wrote mm -hmm. probably 10 years ago at this point um, are themes like the trade-off between um, efficiency and nimbleness and um, reacting quickly in, in an entrepreneurial way versus um, the values of being democratically responsive and you know um, sensitive to community politics, um, the central importance of 
land and real estate in city politics. Um, and that comes through in a lot of the chapters in this book. Um, um, the importance of money and finance um, is a theme that I think comes through in a lot of um, the chapters in this book. So a lot of the common um, themes that, um, that I see as I read throughout the, the, the two-volume set really are, um, you know, I saw in my research on re urban redevelopment. Um, what else should I say about my involvement? Um, you know, we can go on to talk to Dr. DeGraff and then come back on some of those themes that you've uh, outlined. Let me introduce to the students and to the audience Dr. Lawrence or Larry DeGraff, who is Professor Emeritus of History at Cal State University Fullerton. He truly is one of the deans of the history of, of Los Angeles, um, certainly was extensively quoted in some of the stuff that I've written in my dissertation, and many, many of us uh, use uh, a lot of his work. Uh, he uh, wrote a dissertation uh, Negro Migration to Los Angeles, 1930 to 1950. A lot of us have talked about demographic shift and why did that occurred at that particular moment. This is the uh, 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 academic who really is the expert on that. He's also author of City of Black Angels, Evolution of Los Angeles' Ghetto, 1890 to 1930, and California's Black, a, Blacks, a Bibliographical Essay in the Guide to a History of California, the, one of the preeminent historians um, Dr. DeGraff, tell us a little bit about your involvement and what you wrote in this book. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me start off with a little bit of a sales pitch. We haven't had that yet, exactly. Uh, why should you have this book? Well, first of all, as Steve said, it, uh, it's very much a primer on Los Angeles history. There's probably no other book, or two books in this case, that summarize the history of Los Angeles as well as this. Uh, in rereading the essays and preparation for coming over here, I couldn't help but be struck about how much of Los Angeles history we managed to pull to, to get yeah. So yeah. seriously, if any of you are thinking of going on to do studies in California or Los Angeles history, this <coughs> is a must for your shelf. Now, it's not the sort of book that you uh, would take to uh, bed to, uh, to read unless you want to fall asleep, uh, but uh, it is a book that you'll go back to time and time again if you're in this uh, field. Um, now, my own uh, uh, topic, was, as my background uh, fits, uh, on race, ethnicity, and immigration, and the government of the city of Los <coughs> Angeles. Now, this posed a little bit of a problem. Some of the authors were fairly lucky in a sense. They could go to the city archives, and archives, of course, as most of you know, are often laid out by so-called record groups, and record groups usually are related to agencies. So, for instance, uh, one person had housing as his topic originally, so he went to the city archives and said, let me look at the city housing <coughs> commission, which Los Angeles has had since about 1913, and he went through housing. He soon found that was more than he could handle, and uh, since I was one of the editors, came in and said, I've got to have some help. So we decided to divide the housing article in half. Part of it would be on the interesting phenomenon of redevelopment. And then we scratched our heads and wondered who did we know who would uh, uh, work in redevelopment. That's when Steve suggested he had a bright young student that we might go to, and that's how Marilyn Mark came to join the crew and uh, wrote the separate article on redevelopment. Uh, footnote to that. You never really know what sort of a pitch life is going to take for you. We didn't start out to write an article on redevelopment. We didn't start out putting some people on this uh, panel. But as things work out, we had a need. So if you choose a topic to work on and devote some of your career to, don't be worried necessarily that, gee, if I wasn't initially asked to do something on this topic, you never know what crazy bounces are going to come around that would bring you in. OK, well, I was one of the less lucky ones, because you look at the history of the city of Los Angeles and try to find an agency that deals expressly with race or ethnicity or immigrants or even civil rights. They were not in existence until after World War II, and even to this day, there is no significant agency in the city of Los Angeles that deals with it. So what I found I had to do uh, was to find out what was going on with various racial groups in Los Angeles and see what the city of Los Angeles was doing about it. And second tip, remember the famous Sherlock Holmes uh, story about the dog that didn't bark? 
often in history what you look for is as much what didn't happen as what did. And that is the big theme of the earliest part of the history of race and ethnicity and immigrants in Los Angeles. It's not what Los Angeles city government did as much as what it didn't do. Case in point, African Americans. African Americans, of course, have been in Los Angeles since its inception. Almost half of the founding party of Los Angeles had African ancestry. But they have not been a significant uh, part of Los Angeles' population until the 20th century, uh, really significant, uh, during and after World War II. When they were here, they tended to be secluded. Uh, the ghetto, as we call it, the term that perhaps some of you have heard too much lately, was very much in vogue when Steve and I were going to school. Um, it, of course, is an area which is populated predominantly by people who are not representative of the majority population. So Los Angeles, uh, from about 1890, began to have its African Americans congregate at the north end of Central Avenue, and pretty soon they found that for various reasons, there weren't too many other places they could live, which raises the question they were being segregated. What did the city do about it? And all the way down to the 1960s, the answer is essentially nothing. It just allows realtors, property owners, and so forth to say, we will not uh, let blacks live here. Blacks have sometimes found the same sort of thing in um, uh, public accommodations, such as restaurants. In the early 1900s, one black Amer American went with his white friend into the local bar. They both got a beer. The white man was charged five cents. The black man was charged a dollar. He was rather furious at this, so he went to the city attorney, a fellow by the name of Shank, and said, isn't this discrimination? The attorney's reply, no. The owner of a restaurant has the right to charge anybody anything he wants to. So-called Shank's rule lasted for years in Los Angeles local law, and blacks simply had to pay whatever a restaurant would charge if it even agreed to serve them. So these are two examples of the policies that Los Angeles followed toward African Americans all the way down just about to the time of the Watts uprising in the 1960s. It did very little. Now, a few other cases, it did have its own law. One case is often an overlooked point, that about one-third of all Los Angeles' population, when we start this book in 1850, was Native American or Indian. How were they regarded? They were regarded as outcasts, as something totally different from the rest of the population particularly because of their tendency uh, to wander around the streets and sometimes uh, go into bars and uh, get drunk. So a standard policy of the city of Los Angeles was its so-called vagrant law, that anybody found wandering around the city could be charged with being a vagrant and jail. Uh, once he was uh, uh, in jail, um, then often he was given liquor. Uh, he was released from jail, he would wander around drunk, be arrested again, and so forth. After a few arrests, a vagrant was put to work. Indians wound up digging many of the early irrigation canals as the criminal vagrant workers. After so many uh, hours and so many days of digging, they'd be released from their job, uh, arrested once again as vagrants or drunk, and put to work again. So that's an example of Los Angeles having policies that were deliberately discriminatory uh, toward uh, minorities, particularly in the 19th century. Final example, and then I'll turn uh, Pauling back to our chair, uh, would be in the more recent times. Uh, various things, the civil rights movement, World War II, which really launched the first significant protest, the Zoot Suit, riots uh, of servicemen beating up Mexican-Americans and some blacks who dressed in peculiar outfits that some of you uh, may have seen uh, revived in recent years, called zoot suits. Uh, these are all early omens that minorities were not going to remain passive in Los Angeles. And so from World War II on, there were sporadic incidents, often between minority and police. You cannot look at minority history without being deeply involved in the LA Police Department. Mm -hmm. But all of this really exploded, of course, in 1965 in the Watts Uprising, and it was after that that a series of movements began to take place within Los Angeles government. For one thing, they set up a human relations commission uh, to begin to look into uh, relations between races and try to improve them. The city housing commission um, began to look into housing dis discrimination. Fortunately, uh, by the late 60s, Proposition 14, which had banned any fair housing laws, in effect, was repealed or overruled by the courts. 
Uh, the federal government passed a significant fair housing law, and by the 1970s, the Los Angeles ghetto began to give way to a, uh, an interesting situation in which those African Americans and other minorities who could afford it moved out of the city of Los Angeles, or at least out of areas like South Central, uh, to a more attractive housing. And what we get then is what one uh, sociologist has referred to as the bifurcation of race in Los Angeles. You get a middle class black element, and these tend to be a majority of all blacks who move into suburbs, a topic I've dealt with in a recent book called Seeking El Dorado, uh, essays on African Americans in California. You get a lower income, often <coughs> underclass element of blacks and Mexicans remaining in South Central Los Angeles. This remains a real issue today. It is less an issue of color or race than it is an issue of economic status. <coughs> so the conclusion is, as I say in my title, the changing place and face of race in Los Angeles city government. What was the most oppressed minority? That will change from Indians to Chinese to Mexicans Chinese. to blacks to take your pick today. What is the place of race? It can be a as demeaning as perpetual vagrancy and essentially slave labor, it can be a matter of income rather than color. And always, though, it is changing, which is my final uh, point, I think. It's hard to take a model, particularly mm -hmm. a model like white majority and other group minority, mm -hmm. and apply it to Los Angeles, certainly since the last 10 or 15 years. So as students, you have to begin with a concept, but always be ready to challenge that concept. Ask, is this model really valid for the time? Well, we, we have a question for you that I'll we'll ask after I let Steve Erick kind of talk about his contribution to this book that uh, students and I have been uh, dealing with in class about black political incorporation in the early Ooh. 60s, how that occurred, yet we get the riots. But I'll, I'll lay that out in a second yes. after. Steve, talk a little bit about your contribution it's, to the book. When you're on the editorial board, you do have influence over who gets to write the chapters, like Mara. And uh, I sort of self-appointed myself to write the chapter on harbor and airports. And that became the blueprint for portions of the book that some of you were reading, uh, Globalized in LA. Now, Hinda Rudd, there was method in Hinda's madness. She wanted to showcase the city archives, the primary source materials, as much as possible. Now. You know, the part of L.A. government that I have really sort of focused on is the government within the government, the so-called proprietary department, semi-autonomous, Department of Water and Power, airports and harbor. And just like, and, and they've been independent, more or less, for a lot of years. The last couple of mayors from Tom Bradley on tried to rein them in. Well, guess what? It's the same with their archives. You can find the city council minutes and everything over the Irwin Piper Technical Center, but you have to go to the Department of Water and Power or airports or harbor to get the real archives. I mean, they really see themselves as separate, right? Or at least they did historically from downtown government. And what you find is that there are credible variations between the various departments. The Department of Water and Power, and the reason that I'm not yet writing a book on DWP, I'm going to. It's going to be called Mulholland's Gift, but I'm writing a book on San Diego. It's low-hanging fruit right now. It's quick and dirty, called Paradise Plundered. But the reason is, is that they collected, they had historically such a great record retentions policy. It's been a little tattered the last couple of years. They collected everything, and then they microfilmed and microfiched everything. It's 10 years' worth of work just to go through it. The airports department, when I went in with Tommy Kim, my graduate student, who's the co-author on the harbor and airports section, when we went into the airports, they had just started to put their archives together, and there were these, and it was fabulous. You had these letters, right, to the Ford Motor Company about having them come out, right, to build their Ford tri-motor uh, airplane and build their factory and somehow put it right next to this uh, fledgling municipal airport incredible communication, but you went down to the harbor department and it was a black hole. You got the board correspondence and only in the last year or two, uh, Bob Henry, who used to be the uh, city council liaison for the harbor department, 
has sort of taken it upon himself to put their records together. The problem with records and archives is this. Unless you've got a great record retention policy on the front end, once you throw it away, you can't retrieve it. It's gone. But as I said, Los Angeles relative to San Diego, trying to study San Diego is like an overgrown suburb in terms of how amateurish its archives are. Or my dissertation was on San Francisco historically. The problem in San Francisco was it was called the earthquake and fire of 1906. It burned the city hall and all the city archives. So there's a black hole in terms of early San Francisco. San Diego just never was asleep at the switch. But Los Angeles, generally speaking, has an excellent set of archives. There are variations across the departments. But that was part of the fun of it. Now, briefly, the story. You're reading Globalizing LA. LA is 15 miles from the ocean. How can you have a harbor department without having the city at the ocean? Well, that is an improbable story of how the city actually created a little thing called the shoestring addition, a little finger of land to go down and tickle the once independent cities of San Pedro, never say Pedro, Pedro and Wilmington, and to consolidate with them, and that becomes right where LA's harbor is. But Wait, how, how long is that string for the students to understand? It's about 15 miles. So yeah, 15 13 miles to 15 miles. It's about two blocks, three uh, some it's places. Th th three or wide. four blocks wide, and th the dang, the darn, I better watch my language here, right? The darn boat was, I mean, the pro annexation forces won by something like 15 or 18 votes because the Gardena folks nearby thought that the Blue Bloods downtown would drive their poker parlors out of business circa 1906, 1907, and they campaigned actively against having an L.A. sphere of influence down there. But just think about it. If 15 voters in this unincorporated area had voted against it, L.A. wouldn't have this great point system. Anyway, so, but you're reading the book, you can tell, I mean, now, of course, these are the, the, the economic engines that have globalized the Los Angeles economy, the port of LA and the companion port, nearby port of Long Beach, are the nation's gateway to the Pacific Rim in terms of trade being put, you know, uh, uh, containers put on the back end on trains, shipped to places like yeah, Chicago. We've been talking in class about the progressive movement. Some of you have mentioned that. And when we talk about it, we've talked about their um, wanting to create an, a, an efficient government system and creating, giving a, um, a autonomy, fiscal autonomy to the uh, harbor, airport, et cetera, giving it to political autonomy, creating a, a great technician in different cases, um, and most of all, giving it a tangible project to go and build. And that's why these departments, when you view them as departments, that they've been so successful, okay? So how did these departments start off, and how did they gain their independence? And then I want to talk to Dr. Mara Martin. Why did the CRA, uh, so he's uh, a little bit like, like some of the students, is uh, Dr. Ray Sonenstein, <laughs> and we'll get to him in a second. Um, so we have the progressive movement that creates this, what we, we were calling the, uh, uh, the dominant public policy paradigm in class, and we talked about the five elements of that. Right. This is what he's talking about uh, here in terms of the harbor and the airport. Explain a little bit about that, and then Dr. Marks, if we could talk to you about the uh, community redevelopment agency, which is also politically autonomous, also fiscally autonomous, um, but why is it, in some, the perception of many, not as successful as these others? Well, you, you, it's more than just efficiency, it's about capacity. Look, we were an underdeveloped region. And why would conservative Republican business community, and they ran Los Angeles in this period of time, create this very powerful local government, these public enterprises, you know, the strength of the municipal ownership movement? It was partly because they were facing, I mean, what happened in, in L.A. was a colonial revolt against the railroad, the Southern Pacific machine. And, one way, and the railroad had designs on the harbor and wanted a private harbor called, you know, the uh, Port of Los Angeles, only it was in Santa Monica Bay. 
but just, it for was the scenes, seen, there's a uh, in the movie there will be blood. There's a little bit of that politics. There is a little bit of it, but it was all about you have to have you have to have a powerful weapon to fight in a sense a very powerful outside force. And so what they did is they created very powerful local government agencies starting with the Harbor Department, with the Department of Water and Power. Now, why would conservative Republican businessmen get into public power? Well, it was all about, you had a 4,000 foot drop, right, from the Owens Valley to Los Angeles, and you could have cheap hydroelectric power, and you could pay off the water bonds. It was, a lot of this was just about project financing on the front end. LA sort of backed into this. But these agencies in an underdeveloped region, it was not only efficiency, it was capacity. They could go deeply into debt. They could form partnerships like with the Army Corps of Engineers. And in a sense, what they did is they could be powerful engines of growth. This is really what we call state capitalism right. more than anything else. I mean, this is a, uh, where we talk about uh, government being run like a business. Uh, uh, Dr. Mark, talk business. a little bit about uh, um, the, the uh, Community Redevelopment Agency. Well, the Community Redevelopment Agency of the City of L.A. Um, is also semi-autonomous. Um, I guess the history of it is that in beginning, I guess, in the, the 1920s, the problems of um, urban decay and blight and decline started to take on prominence as, a, as a, um, an idea that, you know, nationally there was this idea that that areas of um, cities were becoming blighted and falling into decay and needed to be redeveloped, okay? Um, and here in Los Angeles, we had areas of town that were decaying. I mean, um, Bunker Hill, where you know, now there are a bunch of gleaming high rises, used to be um, a very, very steep grade. And there were all these lovely Victorian mansions um, that over the years, um, became, um, you know, the wealthy people who lived there moved out, they moved further west, and um, those wooden structures were then um, divided up and they became, um, they went from being like single family, lovely Victorian single family homes to being essentially flop houses. And there were all these like, you know, wooden structures that were really close together on these really steep streets that, you know, people couldn't get, cars couldn't go up and down, buses couldn't get up and down. And so pretty soon, this area of Bunker Hill became physically cut off from the rest of the city. Um, and so around this time, this is when just nationally the problem of urban decay became, you know, it, it, it kind of became in vogue to think of this as, as a problem that required not only market, you know, private, the private sector, private developers to come in and do something about, but it became... Um, in vogue to think of this as something that the government could actually get into the business of doing something about. Um, the state of California passed one of the early laws authorizing a redevelopment agency um, in local cities to um, basically empowering them to um, raise financing um, and very importantly declare an area as blighted and um, use the power of eminent domain, which means use the power of a government entity to seize private property for some higher public purpose. And Los Angeles was one of the first places to use a very um, innovative system of um, finance to basically fund mm -hmm. these projects. It's almost very similar in terms of the story you're talking about. Yeah, but except for, you know, I, I disagree with um, Dr. DeGraff. I had a really hard time with my archives because <laughs> everyone, you know, his, he had no archives. He had some archives That's that were good and some that were bad. I had the redevelopment agency archives, which were um, basically non-existent before, you know, a certain period of time. Then I had the city of L.A., and while I was there using the archives of the Piper Center, they were literally shredding documents because they were out of space. And then the redevelopment agency, because the redevelopment law is a state law, some of my stuff was up in Sacramento, some of it didn't exist. Then Dr. Erie said, hey, the Chamber of Commerce was actively involved, so check out the Chamber of Commerce archives. Well, this is like in the basement somewhere off-site at USC, and you know, 
all the stuff is like water damage. So I had a really hard time seriously. Yeah. But let me ask, have you told them about those? They had a stenographer in the LA chamber taking down every word. This is unexpurgated, unedited about how to encourage desirable immigration to LA back in the 20s and discourage undesirable immigration. It's all there. It is just, you know, smoking gun after smoking gun. Yeah, it was actually pretty fun. Gun. I mean, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a historian, <laughs> as all the people on the editorial board complaining about my lack of proper footnotes and stuff can attest. But um, the Chamber of Commerce archives, as a non-historian, I have to say, they were pretty fun. And I, um, almost as fun as like wasting time on YouTube and stuff. If you ever want to entertain yourself, oh, yeah. go and That's check out. That's what I want to go do. No, I'm really serious. <laughs> Because first of all, it's all the movers and shakers of Los Angeles, and some of you are going to, you know, go and look for jobs at O'Melveny and Myers, and there's, you know, Papa O'Melveny sitting there, and they're first, you know, you read the minutes, and they're talking about what they ate for lunch, what what's going to be served for lunch at the board meeting, and then it's just, you know, the nitty gritty about race politics and what we're going to do about this population group and what we're going to do about this area of town. I mean, it's, it was fascinating. So, uh, Dr. Marks, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Sonia China in a second, but was the CRA successful? Um, for a time, the That's CRA... That's a yes or no. <laughs> what was their goal? Well, yeah, exactly. I would do, you know. Yes and no. No. Yes and no. Was it, were they successful? Yes or no? And then you can go ahead and elaborate, but yes okay. or no. Okay. Uh, Yes, they were successful. Okay, why? Because, <laughs> because the, there were two inherent conflicts of interest in the law. Should redevelopment be basically about building public housing and <coughs> serving social goals, or should it be about um, developing land that was falling into decay and making it economically viable? And the forces of the LA Chamber of Commerce won, and it became about uh, not building public housing, it became about developing land for economic development purposes, and I think uh, up until the last, up until the 90s, I think it was pretty so successful. Who was one of those persons who was really against building public housing that the students might know of, or might have heard of around campus? Case Burns? I have not, I, I, can I remind you I'm an assistant? Professor? <laughs> well, one of the leaders of uh, going against uh, public housing was our own very Fritz Burns. As, uh, we're right now sitting on the Fritz Burns campus. Oh, yeah, he's, he's in the chamber archives. <laughs> yes. so you can go read. Yeah. 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 I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Raphael or Rafe Sonenschein, who is a professor of political science at the University of California, Fullerton. We want to welcome him to the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles Urban Lecture Series here at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, he has written several books, several books that we've used in class, uh, not this semester because they're getting a little dated, uh, Politics in Black and White. I'm and, using it, Ray. Oh, come on. <laughs> which one are you using? Politics, Politics in Black and Black and White. And white. My only yeah, but there's a brownout in that analysis. Nope. Nothing. Uh, Politics in Black and White, Race and Power in Los Angeles, 1993. And then the second book, is, which is an awesome book as well, The City of State. Succession, Reform, and the Battle for Los Angeles, which was published in 2004. Dr. Sonenschein is not just an academic, he's also a practitioner. He was executive director of the Charter Reform Commission, which led to the new charter that the city of Los Angeles had, and he had to deal with all those politics. He's also not really an author, co-author, but he helped the, uh, Calif or, excuse me, the Los Angeles League of Women Voters redo their book recently, which the students are, are using that gives you the structure. It's really more of a descriptive book. Uh, that we're actually using in class today. Uh, so, but in Dr. Sonenschein, what we've done is we've talked about our contributions to the di different in individual articles. And I want you to do that, but I also want you to answer the following question that I'm actually going to ask first to Dr. Lawrence de Graff. And I want you to follow up on that, uh, that question that I'm asking him, and then your analysis in, in this book. The students and I, Dr. de Graff, have been struggling with our analysis of black political incorporation in the city of Los Angeles in the following manner. In 1960, there's only one African American at the Congressional State Senate, and that's um, Augustus Hawkins, mm -hmm. who is then an assembly member and will be elected to Congress in 1962. Then in 1963, 
African Americans go from zero representation to one fifth of the Los Angeles City Council, quickly followed also by two assembly members being elected in 1962, a state senator being elected in 1966. What I find even more remarkable is a school board member being elected citywide, no, not citywide, beyond citywide in 1965. And of course, Bradley running in 1969, not winning, but in 73, which is what uh, Dr. Sonenschein has written about. But my question is, in, when, when we take a look at the analysis of black incorporation on politics, there's a ton of literature on this. And it usually gives us two explanations. One is that the Civil Rights Movement led to the Voting Rights Act and then the Civil Rights Act, and that created the structures that many African American communities used to then get elected. But that doesn't, the Voting Rights Act doesn't come into play until 65 the Civil Rights Act in 64, and then you get all kinds of African Americans elected in 67, 69, 73, you know, in all kinds of different places. Okay, that's one, and second uh, analysis that you get is the a mass mobilization of some sort. Yet we had black political incorporation before the Watts riots, mm -hmm. before the civil rights, before the voting rights, and when I go back, and I'm not a, much of a historian, I can't understand where's the mobilization? What led to so many African Americans winning public office in ni early 1960 Los Angeles? First of all, let me uh, give the background. Black political incorporation, if you want to measure it by actual office holding, goes all the way back to 1918. Because it was in 1918 when African Americans were about 1% of the population of Los Angeles that Frederick Roberts was elected to the assembly as a Republican and he continuously kept that assembly seat <coughs> until 1932, or 34, pardon me. In 1934, he was defeated by another African-American, Augustus Hawkins, who kept that assembly seat until 1952 when he went to Congress. So there is a history of African-Americans holding public office, <coughs> from Los Angeles, holding public office in the state. Yeah, right? but that, yeah. that's only one position one out of the hundreds that exist. What does it show? Yeah. It shows that African Americans, unlike some other minorities, such as Mexican Americans, who by and large at this time were not citizens, or Chinese and Japanese, who didn't vote very much. Why? Because at that time they couldn't be citizens. They were, if they were born in Japan or China, there was something in our naturalization laws that said they could not become citizens. So most of your minority groups did, were not able, for one reason or another, even to mobilize. African Americans were. As far back as the 1890s, there were African American political clubs in Los Angeles. So part of the answer is a long history in Los Angeles of political activity by blacks that finally germinated uh, into their position. Second factor, why were they not able to get on the council when they could get a person on the assembly? Some political tricks, one of which is known as gerrymandering. That come up? Okay, what the whites who were dominated Los Angeles government all the way down to the 1960s did was in case of both Mexicans and blacks to carve up city council districts in such a way that there would never be a black majority or a Mexican majority in one single council district. And so as if it was race Voting, blacks and Mexicans were simply sucked. They never had 50% of a congressional councilmanic district into the early 1960s. Then several things happened. First of all, when blacks had narrowly missed getting on the city council all the way back to World War II when Carlotta passed, the newspaper editor had made a try at it. And finally, uh, uh, Roy Ball, the first Mexican-American in modern times to be on the city council, went on to Congress opening his seat uh, to be nominated. Mayor Lynn uh, Yorty decided it would be a smart idea to put a black on it. Her name was Lindsay, and uh, the next year, Lindsay ran for uh, election and won. That same year, two other blacks, Tom Bradley uh, and one other, also ran for city council. Both of them won, and all of a sudden, you've gone in a period of one year and no blacks in the city council to uh, three. But keep in mind, not only were blacks out of the city council, Mexican Americans, except for Roy Bull, also all the way down to the 1960s. Final correction I'd like to make, it's often a common mistake 
there are very great differences between the African American experience in the West and in the North. On one hand, the South on the other. The Voting Rights Act really had very little impact outside of the South. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 dealt with uh, things like um, uh, actually excluding people from registering because of the vote uh, that were unique to the South. Uh, the, the thing which mobilized African Americans in the civil rights movement was fair employment, fair housing, and police. And those were issues that were somewhat different from the central issues of the civil rights movement in the South. Rafe, I'm still looking kind of for a grand theory, but I guess, is, is it this incrementalism? Is it just that maybe they were better organized at the club level and things of that nature? Uh, grand theory. Oh, first of all, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm really sorry I'm late, uh, especially since you're buying my books. Uh, the first book now is out of date, which means now the history classes have to buy it. So I'm just paying for my kids' education. I finally figured out the secret to having a bestseller, though, which is my third book is free. Uh, so it on sells lots of copies. <laughs> Although, to my amazement, I looked on Amazon and someone is trying to sell it for $39.95, even though the book is free. Anyway, I don't know the relevance of it to your discussion tonight. Um, I had the, a different test from everybody else. I read most of the chapters, and I was supposed to write the overview. Yes. And what my concern was was about democracy in Los Angeles uh, and the sort of imperfect democracy of Los Angeles. because. And that is going to be a way of answering your question, sure. Fernando, by the way. Um, Los Angeles is a great experiment in democracy that has partially succeeded and partially failed. Can you have a great city have a democracy without political parties? I'm from the East Coast where urban politics is about the political party, whether you're for it or against it, whether you're a part of it, whether you're a reformer, whether you're fighting one way or the other. And for minority groups, especially African Americans, your stance toward the party was pretty much how you broke into the democracy of the city. In Los Angeles, political parties are very, very weak. And what that's meant is everybody's pretty much on their own. The other thing that's important about Los Angeles is because political parties were so weak, they didn't really have any mechanism to draw in African Americans and other minority groups the way they did in New York and Chicago and other cities where you'd get some crumbs, you'd sort of get pulled in. And one of the things, paradoxically, that did is it strengthened the black community, because they didn't have a lot of friends. And they had to organize under the surface when a very conservative, very white-dominated city had no interest in them whatsoever. I was a little bit of a historian in my first book. I went back and read the LA Times in the 50s and the 60s. I couldn't find a word about the black community. The black community did not exist. And so by I, 1960, they're like 18% of the population, or pretty high. Almost, almost, but they're getting up there. But then I decided to read the Sentinel and the Eagle, yes, yes. which were on fire, absolutely on fire. Every week there was a cover story about a police shooting or a police beating. There was a discussion about this guy, Tom Bradley, who was a police officer. There was a discussion about this guy, Billy Mills, and a discussion about Gus Hawkins, who had a column in the paper every week. It was like two different universes. There was this vital, exciting black community with a really strong middle class, with a lot of home ownership, with a tremendous amount of political uh, organization, totally frustrated by gerrymandering, as Larry points out, where they kept redrawing the districts to keep blacks from winning offices. So in effect, this was like an undervalued stock that was ready to explode. And then what happened in the late 1950s is the Democratic Party finally woke up in California. And in 1958, they won all these statewide races. This is where we hear about our famous governor, Pat Brown. And that boiled all the way down to Los Angeles, where suddenly African Americans were really excited. They thought they really had a shot. And then the redistricting got a little better after the 1960 census, and they were really pumped. They were incredibly well organized. They almost recalled the city councilman in 1961 in the 10th council district, who was a white non-resident of the district who was put in by the city council when there was finally a vacancy. They almost recalled him. They even held a convention to nominate a candidate, and that candidate became Tom Bradley, was the candidate. This was the height of organization, and they swept all three offices. And here's the paradox, I think, of minority politics. The party wasn't there to help you. 
But once you beat the opposition, the party wasn't there to stop you either. And I think what I grew up on the East Coast, blacks could rise so far and no farther. They could get sort of a partial stage up there. In Los Angeles, blacks were completely excluded. And when they finally got their opportunity, they went all the way to the top. So you had Tom Bradley getting elected mayor in a city with a 17% black population, which is astounding. Also, without political parties, they had to form coalitions. And what they did was form coalitions mostly with the Jewish community. Uh, you know, it's a historical note that it wasn't with the Latino community, it was principally with the Jewish community. Uh, and that's the story of LA. Antonio Villaraigosa, you know, his coalition depends on holding Latinos and African Americans together now. So to win in Los Angeles, it's not about getting the endorsements of the Democratic machine or the bosses or any of that stuff. Uh, it makes you better in a lot of ways, I think, politically. Did Tom Bradley, the black candidate for mayor in 1969 and 1973, receive a majority of the Latino vote? No. We're hearing, we're hearing a lot about that right now with Obama and Latinos not voting for him. No, and I'm getting a lot of phone calls that are just driving me crazy because Obama's running and he's trying to get Latino votes. And everybody wants a simple answer. The answer is, will Latinos vote for a black candidate? Yeah, will I blacks know vote for a candidate? Know that. And I give them a really dynamic answer. It depends. It depends. And that's the truth. The truth of the matter is it depends on the circumstance. It depends on trust and familiarity over time. In 1969, Sam Yorty told Latinos, if you elect Tom Bradley, blacks will come to power and the Latinos will never see another crumb in this city again. And people bought the argument. In four years, they got to know Tom Bradley. And they discovered that Tom Bradley didn't operate that way. And when he ran four years later, he got a very strong majority of Latinos. And by the way, I looked at polling from the 90s when he left office. Latinos had become perhaps his most loyal base outside the African-American community. So when people ask, will Obama win Latino voters, that's like saying you, you went to a speed dating thing and are you going to get married that night? I don't know if that's a really good I don't know. I've, 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 never, I've never been to speed dating. But, Can we uh, revisit that one later on? I think that's just okay, a well, little I, bit I don't know about. I don't know about this panel. We talked about strip clubs and now speed, speed dating. Speed dating. <laughs> so, Isn't it also interesting that the two, some, two of the leading scholars of African-American politics in L.A., as we're celebrating Black History Month at LMU, and here they are. And both from Cal State Fullerton, <laughs> national baseball champions, three times. I one more thing, Sarah, and this is sort of a caveat. Will blacks do this? Will Latinos do that? I would like to challenge the validity of that very question, because particularly in recent decades, <coughs> I don't think you can make a monolithic block out of any of those groups. As I mentioned earlier, uh, from about the 1970s on, once the suburbs opened up and the middle class blacks began to move out of South Central into the suburbs, you have at least two different sets of African Americans. Middle class dispersed throughout much of Southern California and low income still concentrated <coughs> in a few ghettos. Latinos have been through the same thing. There was a very extensive Latino middle class now sprawled all the way through the San Fernando Valley, way down into Orange County, we see a lot of Orange County for that matter, but you still have in East Los Angeles and so forth, pockets of poverty with weak immigrants. <coughs> well, that's what you know. What do we mean? Guatemalans, Salvadorans, so forth. You have national differences within. So I think we have to go beyond those blocks and say, are there groups of Latinos who will back Obama? Groups of Latinos who might be less likely to back Obama. Go ahead, Ray. Let me let me agree and disagree. In some areas, groups really act as a block, and usually that's when a candidate of their own group is in the race. And it's only a matter of time. You know, when Obama started out, Hillary Clinton was getting two-thirds of the African-American vote. I just sat back and I said, just wait. Uh, when Antonio Villaraigosa started, he was splitting votes with another Latino candidate in the primary. By the end, he was getting the overwhelming share. Where you really see these differences play out is when they're evaluating a candidate outside their own group and trying to decide, am I comfortable with that candidate? And some groups are more comfortable than others. And you see that, that's what's kind of exciting about coalitions for me, is watching that process. One thing I'm finding in my current research with all groups is it's usually young voters in any group that lead the way 
toward forming alliances with other communities. They're the ones who are the most willing to take a shot yeah. on voting for somebody from another group, another race, another ethnic yeah. group. The actual experts on the uh, election that just occurred in uh, June are sitting out here. Right here. Out of the 80 students here, I think 75 of them were out there collecting data. Wow. And we had 2,500 responders from the city of Los Angeles. Wow. And they showed two, I mean, we're past, we have the data, and we're looking at the data. It showed that 83 or 86% of African Americans voted for Obama. That sounds like a block. And 77% of Latinos voted for Hillary. That sounds like a block. So it, it obviously depends, but clearly in terms of quantitative data that we collected, um, I shouldn't say we, I wasn't out there. The students collected. Um, it clearly shows that there's some block voting going on. Whether there should be or whatever is a different question, but quantitatively speaking, that, it, that exists. Steve, you want to make a couple of comments yeah. on this conversation? When, when, in terms of black incorporation in the 60s, the three councilmanic uh, seats uh, they occupied, LA was light years ahead of other California cities like San Diego and San Francisco because at least you had council districts. They're called wards back east to gerrymander and to ungerrymander. San Francisco from 1850, it's a city county, it's the Board of Supervisors, except for four years before Willie Brown was at large elections. It was left coast city, but it had everything to do with the slow growth movement, and it had very little to do with minority incorporation until the 1990s. San Diego. My adopted home. Hey, why do we keep talking about San Diego? That's not even a real city. <laughs> no, they, okay. Wait a second. Number you've got one, San Diegans here. Uh, number but one, they, they don't, they don't, they don't have a harbor. They don't have an airport. They don't have. You've been they, drinking the Erie Kool Aid. They, they, <laughs> they uh, you know, they, they don't have a. I mean, the only thing they have over yeah. LA is a football team. You know? Yeah. They, they don't. They well, don't act like. They, they don't act like a big city. San, what, San Diego did. Wait, wait, wait. wait. It's the second largest, largest city, city in California. What, uh, what's number size in, in uh, America? Uh, size matters to San Diegans. We've lost a few. We lost to Phoenix and I think San Antonio. We were six and we're now eight. And there was a big concern in okay. terms of Valley of Secession. You knew that, that San we'd Diego be was nine. the eighth largest city in America. Okay, the guys from San Diego. All right. Uh, so. What is, I mean, San Diego depends on L.A. for its water, for its harbor, for its airport. It doesn't, that's what I'm saying. It acts like a suburb of L.A. You've been talking to me too much, Fernando. Look, we didn't get district elections in San Diego until, until 1989. What few minorities were on the city council down there before were handpicked by the downtown power brokers. You know, in a sense, both San Francisco and San Diego relative to L.A., show that you've got to start with the formal rules, that, you know, the districts really matter. You can prevent, right, their, you know, sort of black majority districts for a while. But you've got to have those kinds of district or back east, they're called ward uh, uh, systems of representation in place. And L.A. gets it in the 1920s. Why? It, it's a second, it's a, Rafe knows this better than I do, it's a separate ballot measure with the, 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 in 1924, what became the 25 uh, Charter. And in part, it was to keep the rest of parts of the imperial city of L.A. L.A. just exploded when it had the water monopoly. Uh, the valley was L.A.'s Louisiana Purchase in 1915. The Harbor District, it was in part to keep these outlying areas that were brought in by infrastructure, were driven by infrastructure, to keep them sort of in the city and happy and some sense of representation and fair city services relative to being run by downtown. So LA gets district elections 40 years before the Voting Rights Act. And that starts the process. Well, Ray, I feel, go ahead and I talk feel like more. I'm up here with my, um, my rock stars. I mean, this is just so kind of um, humbling for me to be up here, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes on what everyone is saying. And um, Professor DeGraff talked about the outmigration of African Americans um, <coughs> from the city of Los Angeles. And so when, I haven't looked at the data yet really from the exit poll that you guys all did, but I can almost guarantee <coughs> that when we analyze that data, what we're gonna find is that African Americans are on just about everything, the most pessimistic group. <coughs> when it comes to any measure like you know, you guys, one of the questions on the, on the exit poll was, 
Is the city of LA going in the right direction or the wrong direction? Is your neighborhood going in the right direction or the wrong direction? African Americans are going to be the most pessimistic no, why is that? on everything. Because exactly what Professor, I would assume exactly what Professor DeGraff just said, that those who have been economically successful and have been socially mobile ha are not being captured yeah. by our exit poll. Our poll is the city of Los Angeles. When they, Ladera Heights is not in the city of LA. And, yeah. that's right. So, and you know, that's, that's one thing that I um, would observe. The other thing that I would observe is um, um, Professor Sonnenschein mentioned this idea of the, the need to form coalitions in order to get elected. We also, in um, the city of LA, have a need to form coalitions in order to govern, in order to get anything done. And it seems to me that one of the challenges of governing a place like Los Angeles, is this need to, like on every single issue, it seems to me, the task of governing involves putting together a coalition on that particular issue, and it's like on a case-by-case -case basis, what do we need to get this issue accomplished on this thing? What do we need to get this issue accomplished on this thing? And I don't know if that's different than it used to be, but it just seems like it's so hard to get everything done, in part because we don't have this sort of, you know, a stable party system or a stable regime that says, this is what we need to get it done, or DWP, you know, kind of running the shop. On every single issue, you know, let's get a subway to the sea, put together that coalition for that issue. We need an affordable housing policy, that coalition on that issue. Um, race, I mean, in the book, you talk about a new progressive era, or is this a new government? In class, we've been talking about modern LA, which is really about your book, Steve, about the progressive movement and efficiency and capacity. We talked a, a little bit about what we call pre-modern Los Angeles from 1781, really, to the 1930, sometimes, you know. But, we've but, but it is abstract when you add this hodgepodge of entities the city, the county, the school district, all these different yeah. departments that we're talking about that are autonomous. The, last week we were talking about the Sepulveda Tunnel and the 10 different agencies that it takes to change a light bulb. And that's not a joke. I mean, literally, it literally does do that. It, it, it's a hodgepodge. And then you talk about Latinos and blacks and whites and Asians. And then you talk about federal policy. It becomes, uh, when you're adding all this to the canvas, there's not a clear picture. It's pretty abstract. Well, take one thing in particular, which is the crazy school system governance structure that we have. In almost every other big city in the United States right now, the mayor is in charge of the school system. It doesn't matter how you do it. The state legislature does it. They do it by a vote. But at the end of the day, everybody says there's one person who's responsible for the school system. Now, I actually thought the mayor in Los Angeles should run the school system. I think it's fairly crazy to have a school board as we do now. We just found out this morning that the W-2s for the teachers that have just gone out are incorrect. This is added to the fact they've been getting the wrong salary for about the last year. If they got a salary. If they got a salary. Or, or some got paid over $50 million more than yeah, they deserve. Yeah, which I like that part. But basically, school teacher. it's a bizarre system that resists the simplification that would allow people to say, if I'm really mad about the schools, who do I go to complain to? And I think that's the legacy of reform in California, which has dispersed power into numerous governing bodies, and it'll all work out for the best. But the way it doesn't work out is for accountability. There's no question. Dr. DeGraff, did you have a comment? Yeah, the only uh, thing I would add is that I think some of the postmodern, I'm not completely up on this literature, but some of what I've read uh, is less concerned with governance than it is with breaking old patterns of socioeconomic thinking. The old pattern was class and income more or less went together and racial groups primarily were sacked by uh, the same thing. Uh, if you're black, stay back. If you're a brown, you're down and so forth. And what uh, has been the social science been saying for the last 20 some odd years is this whole pattern is being broken up by a variety of things, one of which, as I say, is the dispersal, the demographic dispersal of minority groups. A second, they're arguing, is the impact of global economics. And Steve can talk about this more. That when you get a global economy in which a lot of the so-called working class in the United States finds its jobs being exported, then you no longer have a foundation 
of a class economy, part of these models with us. To carry this over to politics, lower class that traditionally have tended to vote Democratic, upper class have voted Republican. If this class system is being split up, then maybe the whole socioeconomic basis of politics is being split up too. It's at least an idea worth thinking about, although I agree with Ray that uh, if, if I were drawing a political model, it's not the first one I'd draw. Okay, we're going to have some questions from the students who are all, I think, eager to ask some questions. And um, But first, I'm going to ask one last question while they gather the thoughts, and we'll get, like, Cornelius to go first and uh, get a couple of you to ask some, some, uh, some questions. Um, because he's my research assistant. So he gets paid to be, uh, <laughs> to be the, the whippy boy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and if I wouldn't do it, the other students would do it anyway. So, so. Um, Mexican Americans, politics, Antonio Villaraigosa. Um, and the so called, you, you asked about questions, you being asked about why won't Latinos vote for blacks. Just go down the line in terms of the emerging, em, emerging Latino politics in LA. And just to make a comment, when Dr. Sonenshine was talking about reading the Sentinel and the Eagle, the Eagle doesn't exist anymore, correct? No. But Sentinel is still the uh, African American newspaper in the city, and talking about how they were covering almost a completely different city. And this is not that foreign because two years ago, in 2006, Right around this time, uh, when we had the great civil rights, or excuse me, immigrant rights marches, the Los Angeles Times did not write one single story about this until the day it happened. Okay? Yet, if you were in Spanish language media, meaning La Opinion, Univision, Telemundo, and especially radio, that's all you could hear. So to the point where many of us who listen to that were like sick and tired and saying, oh, enough already. We get it. You know, we'll show up. I think many of us showed up just because we were tired of the commercials and, were, and the talk. And next thing you know, half a million people showed up. So that, it's, it's amazing. You have two worlds, even today in, in L.A. So start, start on that. Okay, we're going to start with race. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Fifteen years ago, people said, where are the Latinos in politics? That, that is a sleeping giant. Then, of course, what happened in 1994 was Prop 187, which just exploded in terms of political participation. One million new Latino voters registered in the 1990s, the overwhelming majority in Southern California. And before you know it, the Democratic Party had turned into the dominant party of California, powered by new Latino voters. When you go around Latino Los Angeles and Los Angeles, you're really struck by not how diverse Los Angeles is, but how Latino Los Angeles is at this point. I mean, this is not like the black rise in Los Angeles, which, which was to an important segment of the leadership. This is actually closer to the leadership. But there's one other dimension that's really different than the rise of African Americans, which is the invisibility of large portions of the Latino community that was not true of the black community coming up, because the entire black community were citizens who were able to vote. You have a colossal working class in Los Angeles that is essentially totally invisible in the political debate, except as the target yeah. of debates. Not as actors, but as the target of the debate. So what you're seeing is a Latino leadership class that probably represents about one half of the Latino community, which is the citizen Latino community. And that's a spectacular set of achievements, it seems to me. And Villaraigosa's election, I think, is really remarkable, tremendously remarkable. And unlike African Americans who overachieved based on their numbers, this community hasn't even touched the surface yet. Uh, this is essentially a community with a majority population what about, casting about a quarter of all votes, which is still one, Four times one, the share of the votes they cast 15 Yeah, one could also use the argument that actually Latinos are overrepresented on the basis of the registered numbers. That's right. However, when you think of this, I always try to think of the city as we live it every day and the city's politics. And one of the things that I've never experienced before is a city where there's such a gap between the people who live in the city and the people who are eligible to participate in the governance of the city. And that's the kind of democratic crisis that we never talk about, but it's almost like Greek, ancient Greek democracy where you had democracy for some 
and not for others. And that's different, I think, than the rise of the black No, you're absolutely right. Uh, last week in class, we were talking about the city of Huntington Park, a population of 100,000, and we figured out that there's only 15,000 registered voters, half of whom who vote, that you can actually become mayor of Huntington Park, a city of 100,000, with about 3,000 votes. Right. That's a crisis in democracy. It is. Questions? Next question. My question is about the disparity that Dr. Sonnenschein mentioned in, uh, between the neighborhood councils and um, what that disparity uh, brings as far as dangers to those councils and that unevenness and if there's anything being done to address that disparity. Yes. Well, I just finished a year as executive director of the Neighborhood Council Review Commission. It was set up to try to fix the system and we made 73 recommendations that the city has mostly adopted. The problem is when this system was created, the city adopted it at least in part to head off the secession movement and then forgot about it. They rolled the ball out and said, you guys figure out democracy, everything will be fine, check with us in seven years, if we don't like you, we'll shoot you all. That's pretty much what happened. So when we came in, we pointed out that the city has got to take a much more proactive stance to fix the ones that are having trouble and to help the ones that are doing fine and really make it a system. Now, I think it's going to happen, but I think we're going to have a lot of fights. We're going to have fights with the neighborhood councils even, and we're going to have fights with the city officials, many of whom would like to just shut the whole system down. So we're kind of in the middle on that. But I think if we had had our commission seven years ago, a lot of this would not have happened. I remember what happened because I helped set it up with the charter. It passed. Everybody gave high fives and went to sleep. And they said, ah, democracy will take care of itself. I've never seen a neighborhood democracy system take care of itself. It, it has to be grown. And, and now we're starting that all over again in a way. Dr. Singleton? Uh, Willie Brown uh, was at the, uh, at the downtown library last night, and he, uh, he, he uh, pointed out that, the, that what broke the back of, of um, of the kinds of organization that used to live, that used to uh, prevail um, in, uh, in minor among minority groups and, uh, and especially blacks in California, was term limits, and that uh, that it was essentially a, a, a snow job that was run on the people, and that uh, term limits really had no other purpose than to keep the minority communities in particular weak. What's your attitude about that? Well, let me just tell the students that. Uh, Dr. Singleton is referring to Willie Brown, former mayor of San Francisco and former speaker of the assembly who was speaker for over 10 years and probably the most powerful character during that time in California politics. Uh, who wants to uh, take that question? Ray? I'll give a quick answer. I don't want to you know, steal everybody's time, but just very quickly, if all measures were voted on only by white voters, term limits would always pass. If all voters were only minority voters, term limits measures would always fail. But it's not necessarily that it's a plot to hurt the minority community. I think that's an impact of it. It's just that whites have a different relationship to their elected officials. They consider them interchangeable. If, I, if this guy goes, I'll find another one. It's not a big deal. But in minority communities, elected officials are a precious resource. They fought. They've come up. It's Gus Hawkins. It's Yvonne Burke. And you think, I want them to be there as long as possible, accumulate seniority, and bring benefits in here, and it takes forever to elect somebody. They're not interchangeable. They're not disposable. And I think that's a conflict. I'm not sure, you know, Willie Brown likes to say things like that, but I'm not sure it was a plot. It, but it, it sure is a different a, way of looking at the world. I think it might have been a plot to get rid of Willie Brown. Yes, that, that could well be. That could well be, yes. That could well be, it was also a Republican plot, right, to, to break the Democratic dominance yeah. in the state legislature so, and, and break the whole pattern of, uh, of uh, political more, recruitment. So it was a complicated plot with, an, with a lot of conspiracies and actors. Much more of a party plot. I yeah, uh, but I would actually disagree with Willie Brown. I would say that term limits help immeasurably. Uh, Latino political power in Sacramento, yes, and that without true. term limits, you wouldn't have had three Latino speakers. So it's, you know, it I think it definitely impacted African American representation. Uh, John, right here. This is a question 
question again for uh, Dr. Sonnenschein. What do you think the most important uh, reforms were in the 2000 uh, charter reform that you participated in? Um, I think that the two most important reforms, the first one by far was the creation of the system of neighborhood councils. Whether where it goes in the future, it was the most significant thing. The most controversial reform was giving more power to the mayor. I don't think it turned out to be all that significant uh, in retrospect. A second one that I think was very significant, but nothing much has been done with it, was the creation of regional planning commissions, of which there's now seven, that I had a very secret hope, and still do, it's not much of a secret, that someday those will become the beginning of a borough system in Los Angeles where people, now I made a proposal that I couldn't get through my own commission, that those area planning commissions should be elected by the people of those seven regions. If they had, in fact, you could change two words in the charter and make them elected and suddenly people would be electing people in their regions who would be closer to them. I think that's the, that's the um, but I don't know, the I, I secret see. sauce in the charter that I think I'll have to wait until I'm retired for somebody to sort of make that one happen. But don't you think your commission was somewhat wise because they thought that the charter would be defeated if you put in there more elected officials? Well, we had a theory. It was a wash. The voters hate politicians, totally, just loathe them. We, we tried to increase the city council, which would have been a great proposal. The voters turned that down two to one. We found that people didn't feel as nasty toward regional people, who they tended to think of as their people, as opposed to city hall people. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, it was, it was one step too far. In the long run, I think it's the single best remaining reform in the city of Los Angeles is to break up certain elements of the city, keep the city-wide structure, but create a parallel regional structure. You'd get new office holders coming up who could sort of represent a region before the city instead of just relying on the people who get termed out in Sacramento to come down and, and win those offices. Yeah, you just you mentioned Dan Garcia who was on the airport commission, the police commission, the harbor commission. Yeah. Most important thing is he's a Loyola Marymount grad. Go ahead, Dr. Martin. Yeah, I want to ask a question of, of the panel on behalf of my students. Um, my students just got their term paper assignment today and it's essentially, um, will California voters um, vote to tax themselves to make the investments that are necessary for the future, the, you know, the up and coming yeah. multi-ethnic future? And I just wanted to get the panel and the moderator to answer the question for my students. Well, but uh, how about you answer her question? She just give you the analysis you gave on her paper. What grade did you give her? <laughs> so, uh, race. Uh, okay, you, you, the way it's always been structured in our classes is that in 1950, we had a population, mostly a white population, mm -hmm. that if frankly you compare it to the Latino population today, the Latino population today, compared to that in 1950 of whites, was, is more educated, has higher degree of high school graduation, college graduation. The, the whites of the 1950s are more likely to have more children than Latinos are today. So you turn all those things around. The big difference was whites invested in their society, the airport, the harbor, but also our statewide UCs, the Cal States, the, the uh, freeways, the aqueducts, all of that. Why aren't we doing this and now? they would vote to tax themselves to do those things. Well, this is, this is the question of the night in my view, because it's, my students are about to pay a gigantic fee increase because the state of California has, can't find the votes to raise taxes to pay for education. But that's not the same question that Dr. Marx asked. That's because California has an insane rule called the two-thirds rule for the budget, which allows a small group of people in the Republican Party to hold the budget hostage. That's point number one. Point number two is all the survey evidence is overwhelming on this. There are two Californias in terms of voting. The California that votes today will not vote to tax itself to pay for these. But if all those who are registered to vote now, all those who are eligible to vote and not registered to vote, and all those who are non-citizens became citizens, there would be an overwhelming majority in California for public investment that would look exactly like the coalition in the 1950s. 
What happened in between was that as the state changed, people began to say they're not going to be the beneficiaries of this investment. When they looked at the schools and saw that the kids in the schools were not their kids, they were other people's kids. And I think that's a very sad development. That's well, how California minute, went from... Minute, Just about every bond measure to build schools in the state and in L.A. has passed these things. Yes. And it passed with white support. Well, was correct. Now, actually, let me be specific about that. Whites are not a unified group. No. White liberals vote for every tax measure and every bond measure, and white conservatives vote against almost everyone. That sounds like a Republican everyone. statement. White, you know, liberals are just tax and spend. There you go. But the fact of the matter is that that coalition is actually there. It's hamstrung at the state level. In fact, what I would favor the state of California doing is every year putting the budget to the ballot and forget the legislature because that's the only way to get a budget that will spare my students and will have a possibility. It will pass. You know, you're not going to get much sympathy for your students here. Uh, the tuition right. is going to be not even to pay oh. for one class at Loyola Marymount. So, well, I don't know what to grass. say. No, I would agree with that that uh, this is the number one issue before us, taxation. And uh, it, it overrides, I think, all other issues today, including race. But I've got some other takes on why this is such an impenetrable question. First of all, um, just back to your question of what uh, can, uh, can a black person uh, be elected, I would say that um, if he runs as a black, no. But if any person of any color can come up with a set of political ideas that can address the issues of the day, I think we're in a position where issues of race and so forth could be overridden. Now, what's the central idea that has to be created? We need a new idea to offset what conservatives so cleverly did in the 1970s. They built up a coalition which, among other things, in 1978, <coughs> passed Proposition 13. And Proposition 13 was a great big tax revolt. <coughs> and to this day, look at our beloved governor, tax is a dirty word. They have made it virtually a third rail of politics. And what we need is a new coalition that will somehow come up with ideas that supplant the negative impact of taxation by showing people all that is to be gained if they are willing to be taxed as a sidelight, but don't emphasize the taxation, emphasize all of the things that are going to come out. And that coalition has not yet been put to Together, it's one thing that I think you might be looking for in the 2008 campaign. But that's what is needed, something to undo the whole mindset that Proposition 13 set. Dr. Magda Bosco, you have a question for us? Yes. I'd like to take us back to the book for just a few minutes. And so I have a question for the panel. Based on your topic and the analysis that you did for the book, lessons learned. What's your advice to government leaders in the city of Los Angeles based on your analysis? What should they do today? What should they learn from the past? What's your advice? In other words, if we had another charter reform, what would be some of your ideas? Are you asking me? Well, no, we'll go down the line. We'll go down the line. Let's, let's start with you, Steve. Okay. Uh, look, those that don't study history are condemned to repeat it. I've heard that somewhere before. I didn't realize and you were the one that came up with that. I'm not pointing at Barack. Uh, look, you, you really need to appreciate just how unusual Los Angeles city government is and how innovative it is. You know, living in San Diego for 26 years has given me a very different understanding of this city, of its possibilities. On Super, on super uh, Primary Tuesday, You'll notice there were utility taxes on the ballot passed by substantial majorities in Los Angeles, Pasadena, San Bernardino. You know, Los Angeles has a history, and that's, you go back and study it, right, of seeing it not as tax, but as investment in the future, infrastructure, education, and leadership. Bill Bratton, you know, the very popular police chief, was out there, you know, sounding right the importance. Of, of continuing this tax and uh, so that, so that uh, police could be funded. In San Diego, there is no discussion of this. Los Angeles County, this is not only studying the city, but the county. Los Angeles County voters 15 years ago 
voted to tax themselves to pay for firefighting helicopters. There's an aerial armada in Los Angeles. The county of Los Angeles spends $860 million a year on fire preparedness. I just walked out of a meeting. I've been working with the fire chiefs down in San Diego to sound the alarm. The county of San Diego, unlike Los Angeles, spends $8 million. And there's no county fire department. Look, this is a celebration of a city that didn't get everything right. But sure, in a sense, in terms of reach and grasp, it's been there in the DNA of Los Angeles. This book shows there's a dark side to the progressivism of 100 years ago. But there was a boldness and an ambition. And it's built right into the template of LA city government. You have to be someplace else to understand just how unusual and how great this experiment has been. So LA will support taxing itself if you give it the specific reason. That's right. Fire or building right. a harbor, et cetera. That's right. But it, or education. But if you say in general, we just want to increase tax rates in general, they'll say no. Yeah, that's so that's a very different than but even San Diego won't go for it when you when you say yes. Any anybody else comments on uh, what reform you would like yeah, to see? I would make one comment, and it's a point that Rafe has already uh, brought up uh, briefly, that Los Angeles has not had any political parties. Los Angeles City government has not had political parties, unlike many cities, particularly in the East. And generally speaking, I think a lot of people still say, hurrah, political parties are dirty, they're corrupt, and so forth. We don't want them. But political parties, I'm talking now about national parties, also connect to various levels of government and can do so around a platform, ideally, of meeting the needs from the local level all the way up to the federal level. If there's one thing that's somewhat missing from this book, and certainly missing from a lot of the thinking in local government, Los Angeles, worse I think in Orange County where I live, it is the connection between the various levels of government and some consolidated idea of what sort of policies ought to be uh, being enacted on each of these levels simultaneously. <coughs> that, ideally, is the purpose of a good political party, and maybe if the LAC charter were rewritten to make partisan politics possible, uh, we would have more of a connect on these levels. We would have less of this disinterest in neighborhoods and so forth. So Rafe, isn't the California Constitution prohibit political parties at the local right. level? Well, yeah, but what the heck, we're Los Angeles. Yeah. We can get what, what reforms would you propose? It's not a reform, it's an idea. Um, I came to Los Angeles in my 20s, and I think that the, the experience I had is something I would like all of you to have, which is the, comp the difference of Los Angeles to everywhere else is that I walked down to City Hall, having moved here from the East Coast, and started on the third floor at City Hall. And when I got to the 23rd floor, finally found someone in Tom Bradley's office who would hire me as an intern. And not a single person asked me who my uncle was, if I knew somebody, <laughs> if I had given me. money, if I was connected to this and that. They just said, are you willing to work hard? You look like an industrious sort of guy. And I was stunned by that because on the wait, East wait, Coast. So what's your point? That I do took, have a point. There is a you, point. It took there you 23 point. floors, but if had you known somebody, it would have only been a third. The or point was, floor. if I had gone one more floor, I was going to jump. But that's really not that's the point. That was the roof. The point is this: that LA government has to orient itself and reorient itself every few years to remember that what keeps it alive is the new person coming in, who has a contribution to make and that that's the unique value that the city has. Not that you know somebody, not that you have a connection, but that you can actually find your way into City Hall. And I'd rather not have partisan elections. What I'd rather have is a greater connection between the elected officials and the city's residents, a greater openness to young people coming in. And we're in a year when hope is being discussed a lot in politics. And LA is still, for all of its problems, the most hopeful city in the United States, and then that's how it renews itself all the time. Okay. okay, with that, I invite you to thank our guest and to eat some food. <laughs>